So my name is Dr. Liz Clark. I'm a staff psychologist in Counseling and Psychological Services here at Fordham. And um, so I want to say thank you to everyone who has been involved in putting this together, to Active Minds, all of you guys are awesome, um, and all of you for, for being here today. Um, and the <laughs> I was talking with my, my boss the other day about doing this talk. And I was saying, you know, TED Talks, Kind of a big deal, I and mean, it gets filmed, and then it's on the internet forever, and you know. But but you know what? I'm just I'm not going to think about that. Um, I'm just I'm not going to think about it, and I'm just not going to feel anxious about it. And he looked at me and he said, "You do realize you're giving a talk about how we can't control our emotions, right?" <laughs> and I was like, "Touche." Okay. So let me just acknowledge that, yes, I, I am a little bit um, nervous about being here today, but I'm also really excited about this opportunity to talk to you guys about something that, um, that I feel really strongly about. So, um, so I'll start with a story. So um, I'm from Chicago. I only moved to New York um, about seven, eight months ago at the beginning of the school year. So last summer, before I moved, I was walking through Grant Park, which is a great big park in the middle of Chicago. And I saw what looked like uh, a group of college students, and they were holding um, signs that said, free intelligent conversation. And I thought, well, I mean, I'm a psychologist who works with university students, and I like intelligent conversations as much as the next guy, and I had some time to kill. So I went up and I, I thought, all right, let me figure out what's going on with this. So I, I, I talked to one of the students, and we had a little bit of back and forth about, well, what should we intelligently converse about? I guess I thought since he was the one holding the sign, he would get the ball rolling. Um, so there was a lot of, what do you want to talk about? I don't know, what do you want to talk about? So finally, he did get the ball rolling by posing to me this question. He asked me, if you could have 20 seconds to speak, and during that 20 seconds, every human being on Earth would listen to what you have to say, what would you say? So no pressure. <laughs> and I'm usually the kind of person, for, just for context, who, whose mind goes utterly blank in situations like this. I mean, if you ask me what my favorite movie is, I immediately am unable to recall if I've ever seen a movie ever. Like it just, so it was really surprising to me that in this particular situation, that wasn't what happened. I thought for maybe a second or two, and then I said, I would tell everyone in the world not to feel bad about themselves because they can't control their emotions. Because nobody can actually do that. We all have this idea that we're supposed to be able to do it, and we think that other people can. And then when we experience that we can't, we feel bad about ourselves. But there's no need for that. And actually, when we feel ashamed or upset or anxious about whatever feelings we're having, that's a greater cause of suffering than the original feeling. I have no idea if that fit in 20 seconds. I think I was probably pretty close, though. Um, not too bad off the cuff. Um, and I think that maybe part of why that came to my mind so immediately is because in my work as a therapist, so very often I have this experience with folks that there's whatever emotion they may be feeling and struggling with or whatever experience they might be having, whatever stressors they might be experiencing. Um, and then there's this added layer of really intense suffering that comes from this feeling of, why do I feel this way? I shouldn't feel this way. I should be able to decide I don't want to and make the feeling go away, but I can't do that. Um, you know, and I'm in the business of trying to alleviate suffering, so, you know, I feel like part of my role is to try and talk with people about this. Now, luckily, I have more than 20 seconds to talk with you guys here today, so I have the opportunity to unpack a little bit what it is that I really mean when I say that emotional control is a myth, right? Because that's the, the, the title of this talk is The Myth of Emotional Control, which I understand is a little provocative. Um, in order to do that, we have to kind of take a step back and we have to look at the brain and we have to look at evolution a little bit. And with apologies, profound apologies to the actual neuroscientist in the room, <laughs> I, will, I will acknowledge that I, I am a clinical psychologist, I am not a neuroscientist, so I'm going to give you guys just like the cliff notes need to know version of this stuff, just enough to understand what's going on here. Um, basically what we know is that reason and emotion kind of live in two different parts of the brain. 
and reason lives in and takes place in the frontal cortex, which is the great big part at the front of the brain that is the most evolutionarily recent. It's basically the thing that enables us to have language, technology, society, in ways completely different from all other animals, right? So that's sort of our, our evolutionary um, gift. Now, emotion takes place in a different part of the brain that is much older and that is shared with most other animal species to some degree or another. Um, and part of the consequence of it being older is that it is faster and stronger in some ways. Um, and in fact, it needs to be. That's intentional, or at least it's adaptive. Um, part of what emotions are designed to do and why we still have them, why they are adaptive, is that they're motivating. So there's, and they're supposed to be that way. They're supposed to be fast, strong, and motivate action really quickly. Um, if you think about it, if early humans had had to think first about whether or not they thought they should feel afraid of a predator before they decided, mm -hmm, yeah, I'm gonna feel afraid, and then they were gonna sort of mobilize and, no, I mean, we would have been dead in the water or on land, wherever we were. <laughs> Okay, so that's, that's the reason we have that. Now, unfortunately, evolution happens on a much, much slower scale than technological and social change happens, and so we still have that sort of brain wiring. Um, but most of us currently do not live in an environment where there are immediate life or death threats that we need to be ready to mobilize and run away from at any second's notice. This is sort of an evolutionary holdover that we're sort of stuck with, in a way. So when we think that we're responding to something, a situation that's emotionally activating, and we think, oh, I see what's going on here. Let me think about how I feel about that. Forget about it. You're already feeling something about it. Emotion got to the scene first, and it always will. Um, OK. So given that we know, just from the way that the brain is put together, that we, it can't, we can't possibly control our emotions, literally, with our reason. Why is it that this myth or this idea is still so ingrained? Why do we love it so much and want to believe in it so much? Um, I thought a lot about this, and I think that there are a number of reasons. I mean, one, maybe just acknowledging that we're not in control of things feels scary. Um, and you know, actually, um, Sigmund Freud, who, Freud, ugh, who was the um, founder of psychoanalysis and also sort of, we could say, the discoverer of the unconscious, he noted that people often felt resistant to psychoanalysis in part because they found it disturbing to discover that they have an unconscious. And what he said was people seem really disturbed to discover that, quote, they're not the master of their own house. You know, that there are things going on inside of us that, that are not in our consciousness. That's a little... It's a little disconcerting. Um, you know, I also think that at least in contemporary Western culture, um, emotion is associated with vulnerability, and vulnerability is in turn associated with weakness, and I want to say um, falsely associated with weakness. And if you want to um, hear that articulated much more beautifully than I possibly could, I highly recommend one of the most watched TED Talks ever, um, Brene Brown's TED Talk on vulnerability. Um, but because we have a tendency to denigrate emotional vulnerability and valorize reason, I think we want to believe that we can use reason to control emotion. Um, the last one that I want to talk about, I think, is, is one that, that really needs some more attention. And I think that the other reason we want to be able to control emotion is because we believe erroneously, that emotions will lead inevitably to actions. And that if we allow emotion to be motivating in the way that it was designed to be, that it's going to lead us down some paths that we don't want to go down. And I'm not here to tell you that emotion never hijacks good reasoning or good decision making. It does sometimes. We've probably all had those experiences. Um, but it's also true that we think and feel things all the time without doing them. All the time. How many times have you ever felt irritated with someone and in your mind had the thought, oh my god, I'm going to kill him? 
Okay, did you? Probably not. I mean, I don't answer that. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> my guess is that you probably didn't, right? It was possible to have the feeling and have the thought and not do the thing. So in this, there are countless examples of this. Imagine that you are in a monogamous relationship with someone, but you may find that sometimes you feel attraction toward other people. You can feel that, and you still get to make a decision about whether you take any action based on that. Right? So this fear that if we allow emotions into the picture, they're going to completely take over our lives is just not well-founded. We don't really need to be as afraid of them as we are. In fact, not only is it impossible to control our emotions, but it wouldn't necessarily be desirable either. Um, and my favorite illustration of this is actually, I'm just ripping it off wholesale, from um, a great book called Descartes' Air by, um, Error, I should say, um, by Antonio Damasio, who is a neuroscientist who studies emotion. And in this book, he talks about uh, a, a patient who he treated who had had a brain tumor and as a result of the tumor had had to have brain surgery and that had led to damage in a very specific part of his prefrontal cortex. So most of his functioning was totally unaffected. His intelligence was the same as it had been, his memory still worked fine, all of his motor skills were okay. He still had the same fund of knowledge about social norms, about the world, everything. Everything seemed fine. But this guy proceeded to make what can only be thought of as just a series of terrible life choices that just seemed to make no sense, that eventually led to the end of his marriage, led to his losing his job, and eventually to his becoming permanently disabled. And it was a real mystery what was going on there because everything seemed fine. What they eventually discovered about this guy is that the part of his brain that had been affected was one of the parts that is responsible for the communication between emotion and reason. So basically, this guy could think through every possible um, solution to a problem, and they were all quite logical, but he couldn't feel anything to help guide him toward what would be the right decision for him. He, he had lost that ability, and it had, and it, to catastrophic effect, he had lost that ability. Um, so what can we take away from that? I guess another way of putting it would be to say that he lost the ability to make values-driven decisions because he could no longer feel what he valued. And that's why we need emotion to be a part of our decision-making. We need to let it in, right? Now, I'm a, I'm a scientist, at least of sorts. Psychology is a social science. And so I like, I like evidence and I like data and I, I like it when I find that the same set of insights or the same ideas seems to be coming from multiple divergent sources. And the more that I've thought about this idea, the more I've seen that it pops up all over the place in multiple different schools of thought in terms of psychology, in multiple um, wisdom traditions and spiritual traditions. Um, so I'll give just a few examples of those. Um, psychoanalysis. One could say that the foundational principle, really, of psychoanalysis as a form of therapy is the idea that through becoming more aware of our internal experience and the truth of our emotional experience, we become freer to make a wider variety of choices rather than being driven again and again to make the same decisions or perpetuate the same patterns. Um, there is a type of therapy called acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT, um, which is one of the so-called um, third wave cognitive behavioral therapies. And, <clears throat> and in ACT, um, the, the, the main focus is through using mindfulness skills and becoming more aware of and in touch with one's emotional experience in a non-judgmental way, the person, um, gains more flexibility in order to be able to make decisions that are congruent with their values. Um, two totally different therapies, but it kind of sounds to me like they're saying kind of the same thing. Um, similarly, um, dialectical behavior therapy, which is another third wave cognitive behavioral therapy, talks about there being an emotional mind, a rational mind, and the wise mind, which is the combination of both of those two. Okay, so this idea is everywhere. Um, incidentally, I recently, so as I said, I, I came to Fordham only this school year, so not too long ago I went to a new staff orientation 
um, even though I've been here for seven months. That was a little strange. Um, but I got to learn a lot more about the principles of Jesuit education. And one of those I was so delighted to discover is the principle of unity of heart and mind. So here again is this idea that in order to relate to yourself as a whole person and in order to relate to others as whole complex people, we need to make room both for the heart and for the mind. Um, so I think that's where I'll, where I'll leave you with this idea. And um, if, if anyone is still sort of thinking, no, 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 I'm sure I can control my emotions, I'll be happy to talk with you about it later. I love having that conversation. But thanks so much for your attention.